Hello and welcome to the Charles River Conservancy Parklands show. My name is Renata von Schorner and we will be talking about the parklands but in a very special way, in a way, in a visionary way, in a place-making way. And we are very lucky that we have today with us Dennis Carlone. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you, Renata. Glad to be here. Dennis Carlone has been a resident of Cambridge and has contributed much to Cambridge that you all are very well aware of or will be after this show. He really was the designer behind um, the Lechmere area, a lot of planning in East Cambridge, and he has been thinking about the Charles River and cities for a long time. He's an architect, the urban designer. He has looked at public-private partnerships and really is a, a booster of civic amenities, of civic life. So I'm delighted that we're here together, Dennis, to talk about Cambridge, the river, the parklands, and even if it's already much better than it was, there are still a Definitely. lot of potential out there. Definitely. And as always, we start with this map of Cambridge and of the river to remind us how lucky we are to have this ribbon of water and parklands on both sides, the 400 acres of public parklands between the harbor and the Watertown Dam that is um, here for the citizens of Cambridge and the region. And it's owned by the DCR and the Charles River Conservancy um, brings out volunteers to work along the river and does advocacy for that space. And um, you will see the site of where we'll be building the skate park. We'll be talking maybe a little bit about swimming, improving the pathways. These are all aspects of work that the Conservancy does. But today we're really focusing on the placemaking on the Charles and what are the opportunities for future enrichment. So Dennis, I would love for you to um, tell us of how, how do you come up with your ideas and, and what underlays your, your theory? Well, like any person, I think you learn from the past and you look at opportunities that exist and sometimes the past will lead you to a new uh, resolution or a new way of doing things, but uh, history has taught us a lot. Olmsted is certainly a, a name that everybody knows, and the kind of work he did, which we'll cite in a moment, is, is breathtaking. I suspect he went through a similar process, but you look uh, at any entity and you try to maximize the opportunities, whether it's a city street, uh, the river, or uh, an empty field. You try to come up with a solution that balances everybody's needs. And you mentioned some poll, polls that, that kind of intrigued you. Tell, tell us about those polls. Yes, the Gallup uh, poll has done a series of uh, analyses asking people questions of what is the most important factors determining where they live. And um, it was reassuring to me, it might, but it might surprise some people that the results uh, number th top three were not education, basic services, or even the economy, although they were all highly rated, but it was more social offer offerings of a community, the openness of a community, the welcoming of people to that community, and believe it or not, aesthetics. and. Um, they went into much more detail analyzing that uh, openness is uh, a community like Cambridge which welcomes people from all different backgrounds. There are activities to do. Uh, Boston is known for that as well. The first, social offerings, is places for people to meet. Not just buildings, churches, schools, libraries, but even outdoor spaces. And aesthetics are self-explanatory. It's the beauty of parks, the beauty, beauty of public streets or public buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, this is constantly, over the last three years, been rated one, two, and three in mm -hmm. the country. And that, we're not talking about Cambridge, Boston. We're talking about across the country at different scale communities from Kansas City 
to uh, communities in Wyoming. It's a good, broad cross-section. And of course, we are so fortunate to have, um, in a way, the bones or the raw material yes. for great public spaces. We have the river and the parklands along the river are publicly owned. Uh, we have an agency that wants to do things. It might be strapped for the funding, but we also have nonprofits that work uh, on both sides of the river that partner with the state, the DCR, and we have a great municipality who has partnered with the state and who is interested in bringing the river closer to the city. Uh, because as you know, the land between, for instance, Memorial Drive and the river belongs to DCR and is technically not under the control of the city of Cambridge. But the city of Cambridge has developed a riverfront plan and there is a lot of possibility to really make that riverfront a truly attractive place. So let's look at some of the images that um, you have brought with you which are quite familiar with us. Well, first of all, the title slide, and we don't have to go back to it, you saw a canoe boathouse. That uh, was Norenbega Park way up in Newton. Uh, it was a private concern. People would pay a minor admission charge and then could use the canoes, could use the park, could eat there. Uh, it was very successful and loved. Many couples met there and fell in love. One of my colleagues' parents did. Uh, it was a great place, and then it was sold and uh, is no longer open to the public. And, but the notion of creating these nodes on the river enriches the river. Even the architecture enhanced that, yeah. and that's what I'll be talking about. When we think of the Charles now, many people think uh, two ways about that. They think of the focal points, the areas of the boathouse and the bench and the hat shell, uh, and they also think about running along the Charles or riding their bike. It's generally those two that at least colleagues of mine have said. But um, there are other opportunities uh, along the river and that... I'm taking you there now to East Cambridge. Thank you. Yes. That, uh, you know, didn't have that. The, the, when I first started the study for the East Cambridge Riverfront, the Leachmere Canal, we'll see in the last slide, was in pretty terrible shape. And the waterfront was four lanes of highway. Uh, there were industrial buildings there, and what we tried to do was create at least two places, place, places that people would want to go to. The waterfront that you see on the left along the water with a port-like uh, uh, boat basin. Just to, just to orient the viewers, oh, yes. in, on the foreground to the right is the Museum of Science. Correct. And um, right next to it in does, goes the Lechmere Canal. And, um, As we designed. And, of course, it didn't look anything like that then. And uh, some years later, we were able to take a derelict canal um, and completely redevelop it and, and, and with the goal of making a place for Cambridge folks and visitors that was kind of unique with a 60-foot mm -hmm. fountain in the middle, which, by the way, technically cleans the canal, and that was one of the ways we were able to get it. It wasn't aesthetics. It was cleaning the canal. Mm. That was an inexpensive way of doing it. And then, most importantly, orienting the development so it enhances that experience. Yeah. Outdoor dining and security and just a place to be. And, and actually, just yesterday, I met two ladies of the Cambridge Site Galleria and of New England Development who owns that. And they said they would love to bring more activities here. This is, in my view, the the 100% urban space. It has the amenities, it has people living there, people working there, people eating there. Exactly. This is really wonderful. But I'm going to um, move us right along, Dennis, because you have a lot of territory you want to cover and you want to take us to New York first. Well, uh, I grew up in New York and um, probably became an urban designer because of Olmsted. But one of the things about Central Park and all of the succeeding work is it's not just one park it's a series of places, and this drawing represents that. Uh, there's solid nature, uh, even though you see the buildings in the background, in some ways it even enhances the, the difference between the two. Uh, then there's, in this great green uh, uh, haven, there is a, 
a very urban public plaza, and this is uninhabited compared to other times. By the way, there's a, there's a, a lake behind it, which is very active with boating. And then there's even sculpture points where kids love to get their picture taken. This is Alice in Wonderland, but there could be a uh, Mother Goose from, from Boston. This is Dr. Seuss in Springfield, a little less successful perhaps, but still the idea. But one of the great joys about being in an open space on the Charles River, it possibly, would be to have an outdoor cafe fronting right on the water. This again is Central Park. Now we're back in Boston here. And, and, and this was done in Boston. You know, we think, oh, it will never happen here. Well, this was done at the turn of the 1900. This is in South Boston. This was the great pavilion by the beach where people could have a cafe eating. They could change for the beach. Uh, they could have meeting rooms and dances upstairs. It was a huge success. Sadly, it burnt down in the 50s and was never rebuilt. But this is the kind of thing that interests me, is creating places with buildings like in Jamaica Plain, this picture. These are existing buildings. There are pavilions along the water. Wouldn't it be great if there was a coffee house in one? To be able to go there in all weather and look out at the water or watch people and have a cup of coffee, have a dance. Now we're back in Cambridge here. And of course, Magazine Beach uh, was a swimming beach and Renata and the Conservancy are working hard to get swimming back permanently. And there is a lot of support for that. But this whole notion of water is magic, this whole notion of being able to touch water just excites me and, and I think drives me and, and that's why uh, almost every urban space that an urban design architect or landscape architect does has an element of water. This is the Rose Kennedy uh, Greenway and one of the really successful theatrical locations is the water spray fountain where kids fully dressed just get immersed in the water because you never know which spray is coming up and parents go in too. It becomes a great backdrop. And then there's the other dimension at a very large scale and, and not likely to be on the Charles River but in an urban plaza. This is Portland, Oregon. And this is Lovejoy Plaza. It was given to the city and uh, it's a re really a, a recreating a waterfall in the city by Lawrence Halperin, a great landscape architect. Mm. Very active. It's funny that this fountain would be called Lovejoy Fountain. Um, the Lovejoy Building, the Lovejoy Wharf Building, which is right where the dam is on the Boston side, um, is now being renovated and Converse is moving in there. The build companies are exciting. storing it. It's very exciting. So um, maybe um, you know, with this, this name, maybe you should show them connection. this image. It is a connection. But let's go back to Cambridge um, and look at a waterfront area that you designed where you wanted people to get closer to the water because that's a problem on the Charles that we have this river, we have wonderful vistas, um, but there are very few places where you could touch the water, which was understandable for a while while the water was so dirty but now that the water is clean enough you want to have these kind of places well, describe to us where that is this is the end of broad canal very close to kendall square the charles river would be to your right and this was a a, a, a drawing that looked that explained the city zoning at that time it was a rezoning and the notion was creating smaller buildings with bigger buildings bigger buildings in the backdrop focusing on a system of open space but the idea was you can see the kids just right of center that you could get down to the water edge itself mm -hmm. now what's built there of course is the canoe and boating uh, facility at the end of Broad Canal, and that does it in a different way. Yeah, you get yeah. right down to the water, and that's exactly what we need more of. Yeah. Now you also developed this plan, and let's this, help this is, us uh, orient ourselves. Well, we see a bit of pale blue at the bottom right, which that's is correct. The that is Broad, Broad Canal. Canal. So that we were just looking at that at ground level. Now we're above, and the notion here was new open space, but new open space that's set up as a connective system. So you could come down from the top, from the East Cambridge neighborhood or Third Street, which is the major street going up toward the center, up and down, 
uh, or from area four to the left or from Kendall Square to the far left and come into this open space system and be guided, if you will, to Broad Canal and then the river. And in fact, it's the perfect way to walk to downtown Boston from that end of Cambridge. Mm. And that's how I believe open space has to be looked at as a system, not isolated events. Yeah, you have a wonderful picture here, two pictures from, from Spain, uh, it, to a world, world famous picture. And I would love for you to um, comment on those because although they're on a different scale, I think they can be very inspiring. Well, one of the great experiences in Barcelona is the Rambles. And the Rambles is, uh, is an active street. There are cars moving on it, but it's much more a pedestrian dominant street with a center walkway that is active with markets. Markets that sell birds for, as pets, that sell food, that sell clothes. Even the shops next door come out and bring out their facilities. And this Rambles comes from the center of the city right to the point that you see here. Uh, that's a Columbus on the tall obelisk. Uh, but that is the harbor. So from the center of the city, you take this walkway and you come. There's Columbus on the obelisk to the harbor. Now, a lot of the harbor when I was there originally was industrial. Uh, and it's been uh, changed dramatically into a very strong people place, much more tra traffic in the past. Now, a lot of the traffic has been moved on. Barcelona is one of the great dynamic places. We could learn a lot from them. Mm. So let's, let's move back to, to Cambridge. Um, much transformation has happened in North Point Park. Yes. And you did the original plan and the original vision of that. Uh, we were fortunate that there were, was $100 million available from the big dig mitigation and then another $30 million from trans federal transportation money for the North Bank Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it would be wonderful to look at your plan and see of how you made those connections. Well, uh, this is a drawing that's actually in Carl Hagelin's book, Inventing the Charles River, that you helped co-produce, Renata. There's the Lechmere Canal at the lower left-hand quadrant. Uh, you can see the Galleria with the shopping arcade coming into it. And on the other side of Monsignor O'Brien Highway, which is upper right going to lower, upper left going to lower right, is North Point. And that portion that you see there is in Cambridge. When I did this study, nobody quite knew where the borderline was in North Point between Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston because it was a no man's land. It was all railroad tracks. And we looked at making it first almost all residential, then mixed use. And this was our first stab at that, of trying again to create a number of park spaces along the way as you go from the T station, the new one will be at the upper left-hand corner, all the way on the curved street leading down to the park focal point. Mm -hmm. And it, it would have been a very rich experience, and some of that is getting built now. And um, at the time you designed that, you didn't know there's going to be a skateboarding park, which will be underneath the loop, which I think will enlarge that area. No question. And um, because, it, as you said, it was all no man's land, and um, the under the ramp area by making that into skate park, you can enlarge the usable space and making it a destination. And you created a destination here at the end um, of that loop. That's right, where the wall curved and now the round island is at North Point Park. We actually connected it with a pedestrian bridge, which I'm told still might happen, uh, which would connect from the Museum of Science viaduct area Again, another connection, trying to make as many linkages as you can to animate a place. Um, and you can barely see it, but at the right-hand edge, there's a water taxi boat. And everything we've done on the river, and we'll show you some more in a moment, has been trying to make places where it would be logical for a future water taxi by the MBTA to stop. Mm. And you have... Um worked for the, at the time it was the MDC, That's um, looked at various spots along the river. So maybe we'll go up river a little bit. There's a spot uh, between the railroad bridge and the, the BU bridge mm -hmm. that um, you have uh, created a design for. 
I, uh, that's the spot here. I, I loved uh, this study because it was exactly what I'm interested in. This was the no, really a little no man's land. In fact, uh, there was some social trouble there. We'll put it like that. The BU bridge is on the right. The railroad bridge, you can see the track. I'm sorry. BU bridge on the left. The railroad tracks on the right. There is the old uh, Ford building in the distance. Again, the BU bridge on the left, the railroad tracks on the right, and this was our proposal working with the Metropolitan District Commission, Julia O'Brien and Carl Haglin at the time, and their proposal was to build a joggers pavilion, uh, a building that would help animate and secure that place at night. We went beyond that and proposed a ranger living that would work in the building to live upstairs. Uh, we have a little resting pavilion to the right, there's even a fountain, but the whole idea was to do it in the spirit of the reservation, sort of late 19th century, uh, early turn of the century, and make it a little fun. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told this looks like a cuckoo clock, and I said, yeah, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, well, um, as you know, the BU Bridge has been restored, and unfortunately, they did not create the underpass. So your idea of doing something on the level of the water that is still possible, and I still hope that might come in the future to cr have a continuous span along the river. And this continuity of, of the pathway, of the Paul Dudley pathway, is something that we are advocating on the Boston side, because it's so important to have a continuous path, both for runners, um, but also for bicyclists with the new hubway stops Makes um, sense. This becomes a huge tourist destination. Do I remember correctly, you could have put an opening through the base of the bridge? It's not as solid as it looks there? No, it's not as solid as it looks. I uh, saw it when it was open, but... Well, hopefully someday we can still get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So let's move down the river um, and um, let's look at the space that you designed, um, again, for the MDC. Uh, really a public a public club, I would call that's, it. That's exactly what we called it. It's at the Lee Pool. Uh, there is a brick facility there now, which Renata told me is going to be redesigned. Um, but we went one step further again and said there could be a ranger family above, there could be facilities above, just like we saw in the South Boston Beach location and uh, it could have a cafe. So you, you build again on the turn of the 1900th century uh, of making a place for people. And I loved it because the state came up with the public clubhouse notion. Mm. And this, of course, is just near there. This is the state police station. And at that time, the state police were going to get a new building, and that still might happen. And uh, the MDC, now DCR, had the idea of doing a, a Charles River Museum in this actually very handsome building. And we just showed in this drawing how the urban space outside of it and the building itself could be easily adapted to do that. Um, you have uh, some images of um, what could be done with water bodies that are more protected. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a wonderful picture of the lagoon uh, and there is actually, as part of your design in East Cambridge, there is something that is similar to that lagoon and that could have what you show here from Central Park. I, uh, this happens to be the boat basin in Central Park, and it's actually where my mother and her brother used to play when they were eight and nine and ten. And so it's always been, I've always been sentimental about it, but visiting it recently, uh, again, the effort of the conservancy there, much like your efforts, are making it much more of a destination with the restaurant we saw earlier, with renting these little boats. Uh, it's pretty dynamic and it, it becomes theater again, having these active places for people to feel comfortable in. Yeah. So you, you show these very urban, very intensely used spaces. Um, and I want to take us back to East Cambridge of, of this very urban vision that you have there um, for the waterfront and people living there. And it's right next to the, to the subway and, as you said, water taxis and biking. I mean, this is what urban living should be and could be. Well, the, actually, the, the building 
on the left and the buildings set back, those are housing sites now, uh, but not all, as much as I've shown it. But the notion was, this of course was a time when Cambridge didn't have development, was to show the opportunity, but creating a larger front park, including a port that you see on the left, and even a lower walkway, and again you see the MBTA boat, the water taxi, again showing locations in the lower left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. And then you have this picture from, is it Brooklyn? Brooklyn. Yes. yes. And we're not suggesting, or I'm not suggesting, that the park be a series of buildings. Obviously, it would be mostly beautiful nature, landscape. And to me, the opportunity for enhancing it with, uh, with wetland planting and, and more intensive planting, I think of in front of Harvard, uh, dorms on the Charles River, you know, it's the great sycamores and the highway. Then there's sort of worn out grass mm -hmm. and with very little planting and yeah. that can be enhanced. Yeah. So we, we are coming to the end of our show and if you have just joined us and if you missed it, you can then go to the Charles River Conservancy website and see it on YouTube. But I think this image summarizes it of the before to the right and the left as, is it, as it is now, the vision that you do, you implemented in East Cambridge. Uh, clearly, I'm very proud of this, but a lot of people worked on it, and it does take a lot of people. It, it's the communal vision, as I, we say up top there. Yeah. But key is dedication of with people like yourself who really care and give their life to it. And that's a 14-year stretch right there. Well, Dennis, I need to move on. And if you want more information about Dennis, you can find it on the website, Carlone Associates. And I want to thank you for coming today. That Always was my pleasure. Wonderful. And keep these visions flowing. And we try to work together to implement some I of those. I would love it. That is wonderful. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.